Um, hello, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Pippa Kozarek and I run the Independent Art School. I'd like to um, welcome you to the 25th Annual Foundation Lecture Series. Um, the focus of the lecture today will be on the East Riding Institute of Creation Research, which is one of our faculties. Um, there's a slight change to the programme because unfortunately Professor McLennan can't make it today. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Brian Gilson, who's um, kindly stepped in at the last moment. So I'd like to thank him for that. Right, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry about Fiona not being able to be here. But um, I'm sure she'll be with us in spirit. And, uh, well, we'll just uh, take off the uh, publicity. Right, scratches on the door, the work of the East Riding Institute of Creation Research. The first thing I need to say is that as the head creationist at the Institute, I'm particularly involved with the theoretical work, but I've actually, I'm not particularly um, got a clear idea of what Fiona's uh, piece is like, so if I get lost or make any mistakes, you'll just have to bear with it. I've got some notes, but... Um, I'm a bit beyond me at times. Anyway, let's uh, move along. Ah, right, well, it seems that she is with us, actually. I'm um, not quite sure. It'd be some type of presentation from Fiona, I think. So here we are. something about the organisation of the Institute. Fiona is the Deputy Director and um, the way the Institute is organised we tend to, the Deputy Director is usually someone who's been the Director of the Institute. Now the, with the Director of the Institute it's quite an important job, they have to represent the organisation at various conferences and festivals around the globe. So what we do, as this means whoever gets chosen is going to be somebody we're not going to see for months on end, we choose the least popular person at the Institute um, to receive this great honour. Now, the East Riding Institute of Creation Research, the next thing I think we need to know is it's an imaginary organisation dedicated to the investigation of the role of the imagination in the realm of the everyday. So that's now, and we're going to do some imagining. Also means that it doesn't really exist. So, all I do have to show you at the moment is an artist's impression. Notice the uh, high technology, we're a very technological organisation. We get all the BBC channels and more. <laughs> um, also, no windows. This is very useful. No windows means that we don't lose heat through glass 
and people can't stare in at us. Also, very nice gold lettering, I think. Um, next stage. Our future! Because we're imagining, we're imagining in the future. We are 25 years in the future at the moment. And as there's a few of you I recognise here from the past, I'd just like to say that I think you've all aged very well. <laughs> so I'm not sure what this bit does, but I think it just takes us to here. So in the future, which is now, we will be here in the village of Fibber, which is somewhere around all this lot. So hopefully we'll get a bit more detail. Ah, yes, we'll get a bit more detail. We're on the A166, now Sledmere House. So after you've been for your Sunday visit, pop in and visit us. Ah, yes, and Driffield and York, so you're even better placed. Now the way this is going, we're going to see where we are on the globe, I can see this coming. But we're about here if you're driving from Driffield, York, coming to visit from Scarborough. Ah, in early <laughs> days. Yes, I must have missed something here. Still, 2006, this was the Imagination Research Centre. We actually took over the old RAF FIBA base um, a year or so after this, I think. And this is one of the existing buildings at that time. A um, bit dilapidated, I'm sure you'll agree, but for our purposes at that time it was quite useful. But today, this is what we have. An excellent all-concrete purpose-built building, modelled on some of the NASA headquarters, I think, in Florida at the moment. But uh, notice the pleasing decoration. This was one of the um, first great technical achievements of um, our resident geneticist who um, genetically modified lichens so that they would grow on concrete and when they die, they become sun-dried to particular colours. So it becomes relatively easy for um, lichen artists to uh, colour in large buildings in this fashion. Also, uh, another ecological plus to this is that as they take in the carbon dioxide, um, from the air, they help to reduce some of the greenhouse gas effect. And uh, they can then be scraped off the walls, so you can redesign your um, um, decoration whenever you want. And they're um, a source of a very high quality ethanol for um, motoring purposes. Anyway, next stage. Whoop. A little bit harder. Yep. So, founded in the spring of 2007. I think this is about it. But maybe sound. No, I didn't turn the sound on. Ah, oh, yes, the early years. <laughs> the three watchwords of the organisation. Imagination, which I've already gone into a little bit. We like to imagine. Pipe dream. Uh, castles in the air, that kind of area. Creation, making stuff looking at the good creation around us and getting a few hints as to what to imagine about, and realisation, um, which I've just realised, I'm not sure I understand what it's about, so we'll move on anyway. The founding members, Christy Nike, Oreg, Orak, um, Ni Aaron, Kate Lever, our nanotechnologist, Frank Sigglesthorne, who is the geneticist responsible for the Lichen Half project. Watton Carr, our imagineer. And uh, myself, the creationist. Now, we all came together basically as a social group in the early days. And uh, our interest in fermenting liquors, as <laughs> will become clear later on, was one of the main um, combining interests. For us all, so I think we move on a little bit through the foamy nail. Oh ah, yeah, some of the photos from our recent, well, early history actually, summer 2000. We hired um, Ra 2 for a pleasure trip to Flamborough Head in the summer of 2007. I'm uh, sure you can spot which one is me among the group photograph. And then this was an exceptional time in Filey which was the come as a member of the International Labour Party 1935 summer celebration. 
Again, I'm sure you can tell which of the members of the group uh, are present in this photograph. And this, yes, I think this is quite impressive. The third international picnic of historical photographic techniques. <laughs> it, considering we were all wearing jeans at the time, it's truly incredible what these new digital cameras can do. The race track in the background. So, we then reached the point where we should really stop partying so much and get down to work. In other words, evolve or die. Darwinian evolution. Now, you need to get a grasp of this before I go on. It's random, which means that there's no plan. It's to do with reproduction, so like, you get something, and it has something, and the changes might carry on through the mutation. And then there's selection from the environment. So like, if you get mutated, and it's not going to work, you die, and you don't necessarily reproduce. Right, that's it. We now get on to catastrophic evolution which is the way a model designed by our scientists of the way life may have evolved on Earth. And again, uh, we're looking at uh, fermented products for some of our concepts, basic concepts and ideas. But, oh, move. Uh, okay, technical problem. No. So, catastrophic evolution. Forms of life come into existence. This is based on what I've just explained at Darwin. They produce waste. Their own waste poisons them. But that waste then creates the conditions for the next form of life. I apply this to dinosaurs later on, and you'll get a clearer understanding when I explain um, the dinosaur process. But yeast is a good starting point. So life's a yeast. And these are photomicrographs of yeast. Well, this is one yeast, nicely coloured by a scientist of the time, I think. And we move on. So, planet Earth is like a brew bucket. Just, right, we're holding this, I hope. This is kind of key concept. And Earth is like a fermentation vessel. We have an airlock, which acts like gravity to hold life in. Yeah? Gravity holds life on the planet. Earth is like the whole thing, or like the fermenting liquor, actually, I think, in this model. Yeast is life. So, we get this far. Here we have the graphic representation of the fermentation process. We have a lot of sugar, a lot of food, a lot of natural resources. This could be oil, um, oxygen, whatever. We have a small quantity of yeast and not a lot of alcohol. During the fermentation process, the amount of sugar goes down. The amount of yeast, no, the amount of alcohol goes up. The amount of yeast increases, increases, increases to about 20 to 30 percent and then goes into a decline until it becomes zero. Basically, the yeast have polluted themselves to death. Right? It's quite serious, is the work of the Institute. So, how does the yeast survive? Well, the best one, you get out of the demijohn and into another demijohn. Because then there's more sugar. And obviously it's in the yeast's interest to do this, but more especially from our point of view, it's also in humanity's interests for them to do this. <laughs> so, yeast survives by getting out of the demijohn and into another demijohn. Similarly, in order for life to survive, it gets off the planet. Right, you're all with me so far. We've got to leave the planet. But, the East Riding Institute view on this is we're not going to do it in spaceships. We're going to, we've got to develop other ways of doing it. You know, six billion people on the Starship Enterprise is not going to happen. Oh, come on. Uh, leave that. And now we just have a brief interlude. This kind of recaps some of what I've already done. You know. The interlude is the autumn dinosaur fantasia. It's based on the theories of Professor A. A. Bezik of the East Riding Institute of Creation Research regarding the extinction of the dinosaur. It's based on our studies of catastrophic evolution, which in turn is based 
on the yeast theories. So basically, the dinosaurs didn't die because of comets. The mammals didn't eat their eggs. Everybody else's theories are rubbish, but for ours. Basically, most dinosaurs were vegetarians. Vegetarians eat lots of vegetables. Vegetables like cabbage cause gas to build up in the stomach. <laughs> These gases, although naturally products of digestion, are also dangerous wastes. The only possible conclusion is that <laughs> dinosaurs gas themselves to death. This explains the sudden dearth of dinosaurs. But, obviously, because the mammals came along after the dinosaurs, the mammals actually quite appreciated the dinosaur gas, which is why mammals tend to be smaller than dinosaurs were and closer to the ground, because these gases obviously settled rather than floated up, which also explains the evolution of birds, because obviously there were a lot of reptiles didn't quite like this, so they tried really high, hard to get above the gases, and um, it also explains why dogs sniff each other's bottoms. It's a primeval memory of the dinosaur days. And here we have a little one who is soon to become extinct. And now, autumn dinosaur fantasia. <laughs>
interstellar evolution is now what we're out on. We've got to get off this planet, get to another one to evolve. The two things we need on which we can contribute to the life process as human beings is consciousness on automation. Yeah, not all the automation works though. Yeah, come on. Uh, gonna have to cheat. So, conscious evolution. It's emergent. That means it happens if lots of little things get together, one big thing happens, which is not what you expect from all the little things happening. It's planetary. It means it happens with the planet as a whole and not bits of planet. And it's a natural process. It's part of the natural development of the planet that we're going that will happen. And here we see, because it's also to do with consciousness, it's to do with like all this psychic stuff. These are psychic energy which is circling the globe at the current time. This has been building up over the millions, thousands and millions of years of human existence, well, of life's existence on the planet. As the planet slowly becomes self-aware and self-conscious, through our awareness, the planet becomes aware. And it becomes the world brain. Hey, I've got some words. So, I think it's just repeating myself. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Human consciousness is linking up around the planet. Computers, telephones. What this leads to is Earth's attainment of self-awareness. And part of this are the technologies, well, human awareness that we've been developing, space exploration. The planet becomes self-aware. It's got ways of getting away from itself, or like redeveloping itself. Genetics, nanotechnologies, science of very small things that I don't know what I'm talking about. More than evolution, information technologies, and human awareness. Human awareness is one of the prime things. The more of us that can attune ourselves to the cosmic awareness, to the planet's awareness, the faster the planet can develop, get away from itself and reproduce on other planets. Life can reproduce on other planets. So, natural consciousness. I think this may be, yeah. As the planet, this is part of the planetary life cycle. Planets have life cycles like human beings. So, as the planet has become increasingly self-aware through human history, the conscious planet, which is life itself, moves towards, inevitably, towards reproduction. Basically, Earth has now become an adolescent in planetary terms. And to take part in the process, humanity is only to attain its default status. It's like pressing the reset button, you know? All the bad karma, all that nonsense, it can be wiped out and you achieve your goal as a human being um, in terms of the true evolution of the universe. Which leads us on to another interlude, which hopefully is the hymn of planetary enlightenment. So, we're going to reset everybody's cosmic attunement level to level 7. And, uh, this will help the planet evolve. It will help the planet evolve and take itself to other planets. Well, life on the planet take itself to other planets. Chill out.
we are tuned to the seventh level. Oh, come on. And whoa! Ah, I missed one. Um, go, go, hang on. Hopefully, we're all now attuned to the uh, spiritual seventh level, and we're all now in tune with the planet's desire to be somewhere else. I didn't quite. That work joke would have worked a lot better if I'd have uh, not had a shock. No, I don't know. Damn. Right, anyway, we just missed the seed, which is um, this green thing here. And this is compared to, we're designing these seeds. This is uh, not to scale, but this is the kind of thing we're going to send into outer space. The outer coating, coating is a special ceramic composed of Holderness clay, which is capable of withstanding most cosmic forces which are likely to be um, found to deal with it. Now notice the efficiency of our design compared to this NASA model. <laughs> also notice the inadequate and naff dress sense of this NASA scientist. This is one of our satellite photographs where we uh, spy on what they're doing just to make sure they're not stealing too many of our ideas. Anyway, having missed two pages, this is another artist's impression. On the surface, we have chemical, mechanical and electromagnetic sensors, the white and green stuff, and the Holderness clay surface. <coughs> Inside, you swan. Well, we have this kind of stuff. It's a bio-core and auto-mutate system. Basically, it's a library of DNA and genes. So this thing goes out into space and it can search through the library in here when it gets to a planet. And it goes, hmm, well we'll have a little bit from the frog, a little bit from the human being, mix them together. If we eject it into the planet's atmosphere, the, um, these things will reproduce because there's plenty of stuff they'd like to eat down there and they'll create lots of oxygen, kill themselves off and I can create the next thing but this is where it's automated it's all done with clever information technology and software designed at the institute additionally there are the meme galleries and evo alignment systems because what we're after doing is not just getting life to evolve, say, on Alpha Centauri and creating Alpha Centaurian life. We want to recreate Earth life, because Earth life is a lot more fun, I'm sure you will agree. So the meme galleries, we are actually uploading individual human consciousnesses in order to maintain human existence within these little seeds. The EVO alignment systems well, you know, you release something into a planet's atmosphere and it's going, hey, this is great, we're alive, we're having fun. You've got to be careful because they may decide to take over. They may become Darwinian, in which case they might start mutating and deciding on evolution for themselves. Well, we also have systems built in here we can just wipe the buggers out, basically. So, we move on. Oh, come on. <laughs> Uh, here we are, uploading an individuality into the Consciousness Data Bank. Small fee, we do need this for our uh, research of course, but if anybody's interested, talk to me afterwards and I can give you the forms. So, on to the next one. Into space, inner goes outer. I think that kind of sums up what I've just been talking about. Ah, these are an artist's impression of the Eric R. Rockets. Actually, um, these will be, we're working with our sister institute in Beijing on these at the moment, and they're fine examples of Chinese copies of American classics, I must say so myself. And uh, here we have, it's based on the Mir design. Uh, what we launch into space is one of these, and then, ah, oh, look at that. They were supposed to be little animated balls, I'll just explain that. Like these coming out, I think the computer may be slowing up a bit. Because this is 
supposed to be a quite a fast animation where these are all the balls going out to space. In fact, um, we may not get the um, last animation. Could be a problem. So in this one, ah, here we are, this little chap should come up to here. He's not going to come. He's okay, I'm just going to crash out with this and start Do again it. at this Do stage. It. Oh. oh, shoot, had it. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh. Well, I can do it again now. Here we are. Look, it's a lot smoother. So it comes to the outskirts of the planet, checks the atmosphere, checks the planet through the sensing system. Hey, this is a nice planet. Let's land here. Let's create a bit of life. So it shoots down to the planet's surface, and the next thing you know, life is appearing all over the place. It's kind of green measles, but uh, less threatening. <coughs> and that's the basic concept of the seed. As far as I'm aware, I don't know what's quite next. We have, uh, I think, the final interlude, another musical interlude. Dang! <laughs> This is a celebration of automated evolution.
leads us to the East Riding of Institute creation research mission statement, which is, we intend to start the life process on other planets, to accelerate the life process on other planets through controlled evolution, to guide the life process, i.e. evolution, on other planets in order to reproduce the artistic and cultural life of the East Riding of Yorkshire on other planets. And finally, and I bet some of you are beginning to feel pretty glad when you hear that word, a small algorithm, this is my Rolf Harris moment, <laughs> if it works, it's a small algorithmic audiovisual composition actually entitled Scratches on the Door. Hey! Slight technical error, but so. Uh, right. <clears throat> so. The blank canvas of outer space. Well, one of the first things we need to realize is full of galaxies. Each one of these dots is a million stars. Some of these stars, like this, are capable of
Right, Zach. Yeah, the scratch is on the door thing. I'll just explain where that comes from. I was at um, an arts conference organised by the Arts Council in Leeds, and most of you probably heard this by now, but for the one or two who haven't, about two or three years ago. And there was a guy there, and he was talking about um, food in Yorkshire in the 19th century and the different things people ate. You know, like a farmer in North Yorkshire eat really well. <clears throat> unemployed working class in um, Leeds would eat really badly, bread and dripping, that kind of thing. And at the end, in the question session, which is quite a nice place to bring this bill, he was asked about distinctive cultures within Yorkshire, and he said, well, North Yorkshire, yeah, there's a strong choral tradition. Uh, West Yorkshire, brass bands, things like that. South Yorkshire, this, that, or the other. And over in the East Riding, well, there might be a few scratches on a barn door. These are my scratches. <laughs> um, so I'll put the lights on there. Thanks for coming. No problem. Um, if some people could fill out evaluation forms, they'd be really helpful. So I'll pass some out if some people don't have one.